Right, my name, name's John Hutchinson and I joined the Royal Air Force in 1955, did my flying training in, on Harvards and T-33s in Canada, came back to England, flew the Vampire for a short while and then was posted on to Shackleton's, known very rudely as 50,000 50, rivets flying in loose formation. It was a beloved aeroplane of mine and a great servant to the Royal Air Force over a long period of time. And then I was an instructor on Jet Provost. That was my last sort of posting in the Royal Air Force. I then joined McAlpines for three years, flying corporate um, stuff, uh, jockeys to race meetings, all that sort of stuff, all sorts of different aeroplanes. And then in 1966, I joined BOAC as it was, British Airways as it became, and I started off as a co-pilot on Boeing 707s, then the Boeing 747, followed by a command course on the VC-10, and then after 18 months on the VC-10, to my astonishment, I ended up on Concorde, where I spent the last 15 years of my life in the airline. Can you tell us uh, what your first thoughts of the 707 were? Uh, my first impressions of the 707. It was not an easy aeroplane to fly. It was what I'd describe as a slightly clunky aeroplane. If you could do a smooth landing in a 707, at least certainly the 400 series that I was flying, the 707-436, you were doing very well indeed. Um, it was a demanding aeroplane in that sense. But, you know, it was a very efficient mover of people from A to B. It's not what I'd describe as my favourite aeroplane that I uh, ever flew. Uh, its handling was not up to... Not, didn't bear comparison with the 747, for instance, which had beautiful handling qualities, and of course Concorde, which was um, like a sort of sports car to fly. Um, I mean, the, my main memory of the 707 was, to my absolute horror, I thought I'd joined as a pilot. I found I was having to do a flight navigator's course. <laughs> and, and for several months, I was doing all the sort of exam work uh, to pass all the CAA exams for a flight navigator's license. I had to learn how to take star shots do plotting on charts and all that sort of stuff. It was an absolute nightmare. And the route they used to use was London to Bermuda, which concentrates the mind considerably because if you miss Bermuda, you've really blown it. <laughs> you know, there's nothing within 600 miles, probably 800 miles. And you know, all, all this business of the Bermuda Triangle in, in the context of aviation, that's all been solved by inertial navigation and GPS people don't miss Bermuda any longer. All those aeroplanes that missed Bermuda missed it because of navigational errors, of course, yeah. trying to find this tiny little dot of an island in the middle of the Atlantic. <laughs> so what was it like coming from the Shackleton to the 707, a jet-powered aircraft? Well, I'd, I'd flown jets, of course, with, um, it, with the jet provost, um, and I'd actually flown the Hunter as well. I'd done three flights in a Hunter, so I had some experience of, of jets, of course. Um, um, to me, it was just another, uh, uh, another jet aeroplane. I'd never, of course, flown a multi-engined jet aeroplane yeah. before, and that was a big difference. And, you know, bearing in mind that the wings, um, you, you've got quite a big wingspan, and the engines are mounted on pylons below the wings, and the outboard engines are quite a way outboard from the sort of center line of the aeroplane. Uh, so, it, you know, it was an interesting aeroplane. If you had a, lost an engine, an outboard engine, um, you know, you needed quite a lot of rudder input to compensate for that. Um, but, you know, it was just like really any other multi-engined aeroplane. The fact that it was a jet didn't make a huge amount of difference. Mm -hmm. So how long did you spend on the 707? I was on the 707 from 1966 until 1971. So you then got posted to VC-10. Uh, how did this happen? Well, um, in 
1975, so I'd been on the 747 for about four years at this stage. Um, my number came up for a command course and I was offered the chance of either a command on back on the 707 or to go on to the VC-10. And I thought, well, I've already flown the 707. If I could go on to the VC-10, that's another aircraft type in my logbook. So I opted for the VC-10. Um, so that involved a full conversion course onto the VC-10 as a preliminary, and then that was followed by the command course once I'd done the conversion. And how long did that take? I think, I were, roughly speaking, I went onto the VC-10 in about October uh, 1975, and I was validated as a captain on the VC-10 in January 1976. So could you tell us what it was like to fly and how did it handle? The VC-10 was a lovely aeroplane to fly. Again, a very gentlemanly aeroplane. Because the engines were mounted in a cluster at the back and the tail, it, it, in terms of asymmetric handling, it was a much, much easier aeroplane to fly um, than a multi-engine aeroplane where you've got engines mounted way out on the, on the wings. So if you lost an outboard engine in the VC-10, you didn't have much in the way of control problems to deal with. Um, so it was a very easy, benign, gentle aeroplane to fly. And it was extremely popular with passengers because it was very quiet. Because those engines were at the back, all the noise was at the back. Mm -hmm. And it's also a very fast aircraft and it holds some records. Uh, what speeds did you uh, normally see? We, we cruised at, I don't know, 0.84, something like that, Mach number. Um, I, I, I've no doubt it could have cruised faster than that, but then you run into problems with fuel burn and, and economy and all that sort of thing. So what kind of routes would you do on the VC-10? Well, the airplane, of course, was really designed for hot and high airfields. Mm -hmm. So the sort of classic route that the VC-10 was designed for was flying out of Johannesburg or Nairobi, you know, sort of airfield elevations of five, 6,000 feet, where you've got that, that high altitude combined with high temperatures. And this aeroplane was absolutely superb for that sort of an operation. How many crews did that have? Well, we had three flight crew, which was a captain, co-pilot, and a flight engineer. And if my memory serves me right, six cabin crew. How different was it coming uh, from the Air 707? Um, in a sense, it was slightly going backwards because the 747 was a sort of later generation aeroplane. Um, you know, it, that was built with inertial navigation, built into the, into the avionics of the aeroplane, whereas with the VC-10, the inertial navigation was sort of retrofitted onto the aeroplane. Um, so, in a sense, it was going back a generation. Um, but, you know, in terms of pure handling, it was pretty much as good as the 747. It was a very nice aeroplane to fly. And how long did you spend on the VC-10? Well, I was only on the VC-10 for oh, about 15, 16 months as a captain, because in April 1977, the chance came up to go on to Concord and that was a chance I was not going to uh, turn down. <laughs> so off I went to Concord. Well, starting off with the flight instruments, the flight instruments for the captain are here, as you can see, and then they're reproduced on the co-pilot side, exactly the same set of instruments. The layout of the instruments basically is a standard layout very similar to the layout of the instruments on the Concorde flight deck. And what we've got here in the top left-hand corner, airspeed indicator, artificial horizon, pressure altimeter, rate of climb and descent indicator, a compass, a radio altimeter, mark meter, and a VOR RMI compass down there. Also in the VC-10 here we've got a turn and slip indicator there. Just like a Tiger Moth has a turn and slip indicator in fact. 
Um, and those instruments are reproduced on the co-pilot side. Then, then coming down the middle here, you've got all the engine, engine instruments. Um, this is the percentage RPM for the engines. Uh, this is the flap and slat positions there. Those are the flaps. Those are the slats. Um, then the trim position. You've got a standby um, artificial horizon there, outside air temperature and uh, standby altimeter there. Uh, coming down here, you've got the Doppler um, showing ground speed. It was a, this is before INS. INS was retrofitted to the v VC-10, of course. Uh, they had Doppler right from the word go. And the Doppler simply uh, was an approximate calculation about drift and, and speed, ground speed. And here you've got a flying control position indicator there. What have we got over here? You've got um, the, um, oh gosh, the, my, dear, oh dear, the transponder. Get lost for words these days. Um, clock, the flying control position indicator repeated on the co-pilot side. And here you've got a control for what on earth was that for that was the undercarriage the undercarriage you stupid boy of course it was i was thinking, it's exactly where the concord nose and visor control was located and i was thinking the vc10 hasn't got a nose and visor so that's the undercarriage there and the green lights or red lights as appropriate for the undercarriage indicator there then coming down the central thing you've got your throttles Reverse thrust, reverse thrust only on the outboard engines, not on the inboard engines. And that would have been because if you had reverse thrust on all four engines with them closely mounted together in the way they were, you'd have had all sorts of problems of uh, interference of one engine against the other. So uh, the reverse thrust was only available on the outboards. Here you've got the speed brake control there we got the flap selector. Here on each side, a captain's trim control and a co-pilot's trim control. Um, I can't remember what that one's for. I'm sorry to say. Uh, we've got the radar control there, repeated for uh, for the co-pilot as well. And then here we have the inertial navigations, which were retrofitted, two of them. Uh, you've got all the uh, navigation autopilot control switches located here. Uh, then the radios, rudder trim, aileron trim, and coming back here, the master fuel cocks uh, for the four engines. HP Cox. Just in this overhead panel here, just going very quickly, uh, this was a control box associated with the flight data recorder. Got a radio there. Um, you've got, um, not totally sure what that one is. Uh, flying control, a position indicator of all the control surfaces and the tailplane in there. Uh, you've got windscreen wipers there, um, various test switches for testing various systems. And then coming down here, you've got an ADF, uh, that's an automatic direction finder, one there and one there. And here you've got the switches for the landing lamps to extend them and retract them and actually to physically turn them on and off. And here we've got the control for the on-off switch for the inertial navigation system. That's for the one down there in the centre pedestal on the left-hand side. And that's the on-off switch for the inertial navigation system for the co-pilot on the centre pedestal on the right-hand side. Here you've got a GPWS. Um, ground proximity warning system. 
So that's about it. So, John, what were your first uh, thoughts going on to the Jumbo? The first thoughts that I had about going onto the Jumbo were, thank God I'm not going to have to navigate anymore. <laughs> navigation was not my strong point. I think one of my navigation charts on a transatlantic crossing would have looked a bit like a sort of spider leaving a trail of ink all over the, all over the chart. I'm not a very tidy writer and I'm not very tidy with my hands. Uh, so it was a great, great relief to find myself on an aeroplane that had inertial navigation and you knew where you were instead of having a rough idea of where you were about 10 minutes ago, <laughs> which is the reality of the sort of navigation I had to do on a 707 with astro shots and plotting bearings and all that stuff. So a big relief. It was a huge, huge, huge relief. Yeah. So could you talk us through your initial training on the 747? Well, there was the ground school, of course, and you then have to pass all those exams. And once that was over, we went over to Shannon and uh, and we did the flying, the circuits and bumps over at Shannon. That was absolutely fabulous. And I'm not sure whether I should say this, but I'm going to say it anyway. One of the instructors there was in 617 Squadron, the Dam Busters. I didn't know that at the time, I have to say. Um, that's one of the great sadnesses for me. I flew with all these ex-wartime bomber command pilots, mostly, and they never talked about their experiences. They kept very quiet about it all. And I would have loved, I didn't feel as a rather junior co-pilot that I should ask questions and probe them and all that sort of thing. I should have done because they must have had some fascinating stories to tell. Anyway, this particular chap that I'm talking about, I didn't at that time know he'd been on 617 Squadron as a very distinguished member of the squadron. And one day we went out, way out to the west of Ireland and, and, and very near Shannon, there are famous cliffs, the Cliffs of Moher. And we descended this 747 down to about, I don't know, 50 feet or something on the radio altimeter. And we went heading in towards the Cliffs of Moher and we did a sort of zoom climb over the Cliffs of Moher. Wow. Uh, and Anybody standing in the tops of those cliffs must would have been very impressed if they'd been there to see that happen. <laughs> and of course, subsequently, I found out that he was um, X from 617 Squadron. So the idea of flying at low level was just meat and drink to him. It was something he was completely <laughs> used to. <laughs> he was just doing what came naturally to him. <laughs> so was there a simulator back in those days? Yes, there was. There was a simulator at uh, Crane Bank, as it was known. I always called it Brain Crank, but still. Um, and um, yes, there was a simulator. Indeed, there was. Mm -hmm. I can't remember much about the simulator, and I suspect that the visual would have almost certainly been one of those ghastly visual systems where you have a sort of um, terrain um, that's artificial terrain made of papier-mâché or something, and the camera that goes tracking around over the terrain. Uh, it was a very, very rudimentary visual, not like the sort of computer-generated visuals you get today, not in the least like that. And it was actually very disorienting. Mm -hmm. So can you remember your first flight, and can you tell us about it? Oh. Can I remember my first flight? Not really, I don't think. I'd, I think the first flight in any aeroplane is always a great sense of anticipation and eagerness um, and wanting to get to know what it's like to land, how it handles during takeoff, how it handles with um, an engine failure. So there's always this great sense of anticipation with any aeroplane that you've that you're flying for the very first time. And I, I don't, 
I, I, I suppose the main trick with the 747 was that suddenly you're sitting far higher up above the ground than you're doing in a VC-10 or 707, much, much higher up. So the main problem with landing the 747 was getting used to the view of the runway and that very elevated position on the flight deck of a 747. So if we have to talk about handling characteristics, what were its strengths and weaknesses? I wouldn't really say that the 747 had weaknesses. It, was, it, it had beautiful handling characteristics, hydraulically powered flying controls, as opposed to the 707 that I flew, which was all sort of uh, bicycle chains and wheels and pulleys and things. And you sort of sent a signal from the flight deck and eventually uh, the airplane would respond to that signal. I mean, the 747 wasn't like that at all with hydraulic flying con hydraulically powered flying controls. It was very, very responsive, very easy and benign to fly um, and was really an extremely easy airplane to operate. Would it be classed as fly-by-wire? No, it was not fly-by-wire, no. No, absolutely not. The instrument layout on the 747 flight deck was really very similar to the instrument layout for, for all the other British Airways aeroplanes. It was a sort of standard instrument layout for that particular uh, era. Mm -hmm. Did you have a flight engineer on board? We did have a flight engineer and I can proudly say that I have never flown a civil airliner without a flight engineer. <laughs> Speaking personally, I wouldn't want to ever have flown without a flight engineer. They were the most wonderful breed of people. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I can remember innumerable occasions where um, the flight engineer um, would just go out, if you had a problem, a mechanical problem in a transit somewhere or other, um, they would roll up their sleeves and go and fix the problem. They were outstanding and brilliant and useful members of the flight crew. Mm -hmm. and what routes were you uh, flying in this era? Well, on the 747 initially, I think it was mainly confined to flying to New York. And then I ended up doing a, a lot of flights to the Far East. Uh, but I mean, we'd we'd sort of fly out to, I don't know, Tehran and then on to Delhi and then on to Singapore and then on to Sydney. And it would be that sort of a, a structure for the sort of routes that we were doing out to the Far East. I used to love flying to the Far East. I find it much more interesting than just flying across the Atlantic. And of course, I had an upper deck. Could you tell us what is actually up there? Ah, oh, well, no, the upper deck to start with was a bar. Mm. Um, you had your first class down on the bottom deck and then uh, business class behind that and then economy. And the first and the upper deck was purely and simply a bar for the first class passengers. And um, it was a wonderful facility, total waste of space <laughs> uh, in commercial terms, but it was a jolly nice thing to have. Um, I remember once being positioned out to Hong Kong as a passenger and we were traveling first class and my captain, flight engineer and myself went up into the first class bar to enjoy a couple of hours up there and um, oh gosh, what's the comedian's name? Um, um, oh dear, his name's completely gone. Uh, he used to wear a fez. What's his name, Mike? Come on. Uh, Tommy Cooper? Tommy Cooper. Yeah, yeah. He was another passenger on the on the aeroplane. He came up into the bar and he couldn't help himself. He suddenly suddenly did one of his acts <laughs> up in the bar and I shall never forget that. I mean, he, he wasn't doing it because he was making money from doing this act. It was just he couldn't help himself. <laughs> he was he, always on. He even had his red fez with him. <laughs> <laughs> So what was your favourite location to fly to? Oh, I th think I would 
rate uh, Hong Kong, Singapore, and Sydney as on the. I'm talking now about the 747. Um, on, on the routes that they did, I would rate those places as pretty much my favourites. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And was the 747 a reliable aircraft? In the very early days, they, they had all sorts of problems with the planes, um, and you know it was prone to sort of engine surges and various engine problems. Uh, but gradually, these got sorted out, and it became very, very reliable, really. So, do you have any memorable stories uh, flying the jumbo, or anything that comes uh, sticks in your mind? Yeah, I mean there are. I, I mean, uh, one story that I will never forget, and it's not actually a happy sort of story. Um, and I don't, when I tell this story, I'm not saying it because I want to be rude about Australians, because I love Australians and I love Australia. But I remember we were flying a blind man who was going to New Zealand to join his son in New Zealand and he was flying with his guide dog and he got all the paperwork and all the rest of it no trouble at all all been authorized by the Australian High Commission in London and we'd flown down from the, the, the route on that particular service was through Hong Kong and then down to Darwin Sydney and on to Auckland and we'd flown from Hong Kong down to Darwin and these chaps with their white uniforms and white stockings and white shoes got on board to do the sort of health check of the aeroplane and they absolutely freaked out when they saw the dog. The fact that this gentleman had got all the paperwork with him made no difference at all and I'm appalled to say that the dog was taken away and destroyed. No way. Yep. Um, and I know I can remember clearly the captain um, getting terribly upset about this and making his feelings very, very clear about the situation. And he was told if he didn't wind his neck in, he'd be appearing in the magistrate's court. So. There we are. Um, I, I'm sure that that wouldn't happen today if such a situation arose again, but that's what happened on that day and it must have been, oh, I don't know, it must have been about 1973, 74, something like that, I suppose. I don't think you would get away with that um, this day and age. It's absolutely appalling. Um, Nothing so you asked if it's, no, no, you can't argue with these people. Absolutely not. So at the time, did the Jumbo get the response when you landed in airports like Concorde did? Oh, that's a very interesting question. I don't, I, I don't think it did actually, Mike. Okay. I, th I, th I think people have just got used to it. Um, um, that's a very interesting question. I hadn't actually sort of thought about that. I, I mean, I suppose because it was a subsonic aeroplane and basically it looked like a sort of overgrown 707, it wasn't that much different. Um, it was just a lot bigger. And being a lot bigger doesn't necessarily sort of capture the imagination. I mean, Concorde was such a different shape and it flew at such different speeds and different heights that it created a sort of sense of wonderment and awe in anybody who looked at it uh, in a way that the 747 really couldn't command that sort of reaction in people, I think. I mean, the, the, the final version of it that British Airways has been flying and still flying today, the 747-400, was a very, very different 747 from the 747-100 that I flew with a flight engineer. I mean, the 747-400 was a glass cockpit aeroplane. I've never flown a glass cockpit aeroplane. It didn't have a flight engineer. So it's a completely different aeroplane. I mean, Hugely different. I, I, here again, I'm using approximate figures, but I think the maximum all-up takeoff weight for 
my version of a 747 that I flew was around 330 tons oh. maximum all up weight. Uh, the 747 400 is about 430 tons. So you're talking about a hundred tons heavier airplane, very, very different airplane indeed. And that's one of the incredible things about the 747, that there were so many different versions of it built during its lifetime. Mm -hmm. And just talking about the takeoff there, was it difficult to land being such a big aircraft? No, it wasn't. It, it, I mean, the thing that you had to get used to was the height that you were above the runway as you were in the flare, because you were a long way up. Uh, but once you got used to that, and that became what was normal for you, um, no, it was it was it was a very it was a very benign airplane, and it handled extremely well in a crosswind, mm -hmm. as well, very well. So, how long did you fly on the seven four seven, and did you enjoy it? I was on the seven four seven from oh gosh, about January nineteen seventy one until the middle of nineteen seventy five. So I was on it for about four and a bit years, four and a half years, something like that. And I loved it. I've got very happy memories of the 747. Um, it was a nice aeroplane to operate, nice aeroplane to fly. Um, and, you know, we, we'd have these slips, there'd be the three of us flight crew, and we had, I think, gosh, I think we had 12 cabin crew. So, you know, when we were stopping off at en route places like Karachi or something, uh, Karachi springs to mind because, in fact, in Karachi, we used to stay at a BOAC facility there, a BOAC rest house, which also had Qantas crews staying there. And it only, it only looked after BOAC and Qantas crews. And we used to have some hilarious slips in Karachi involving lots of uh, games of tennis and going out on fishing expeditions and all sorts of things. I mean, it was a very, if, in that sense, because you've got a large crew, it was a very sort of sociable aeroplane. So, John, what have, been, uh, what have you been up to since the last time we spoke? Well, basically I've given up flying because my eyesight isn't really up to the sort of standard that I feel happy about. It's perfectly all right for normal day-to-day -day living, but I have great problems actually seeing potential conflicting traffic. Like my bird-watching days, for instance, uh, unless I use binoculars are over, I can't distinguish the, the detail of a bird uh, with the naked eye. So um, I decided it was time to quit. Having said all that, um, last a year ago in April, on my 80th birthday, my wife Sue and my son Chris clubbed together and bought me a Spitfire flight, wow. which I did from Duxford with a wonderful chap, a good friend of mine called Cliff Spink, who's a, a retired air marshal. And he's the most delightfully modest and courteous man, an absolute delight. So if anybody's wanting to do a Spitfire flight, can I strongly recommend that you insist on flying with Cliff Spink. He's utterly brilliant. Anyway, he gave me this thorough briefing and said, look, John, just treat this as an overgrown tiger moth. It's, that's all it is. It's a lovely, easy aeroplane to fly. He said, sadly, I've got to do the takeoff and the landing for insurance reasons. He said, you can do the rest of it. And he was as good as his word. As soon as we got airborne, I had control and we flew over to my village, Kelshall, and we did a few turns, steep turns over there followed by a victory roll as we departed. And then I went over to a nice clear piece of airspace uh, near Wimpole in Cambridgeshire and um, did a whole lot of aerobatics there and it all came flooding back. It was absolutely marvelous. And then we came back to Duxford and came in and landed. And I must have walked, got out of that cockpit with a grin that stretched from ear to ear. Something in your remember forever. Yeah, it's something I will absolutely remember forever. Thank you very much, Cliff Spink. Well, John, thanks very much for being on the show. It's a great pleasure, Mike. It's been very nice to talk to you.